All right, we got everyone. Okay, welcome. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have our students each introduce themselves um, and answer a question. Uh, but first I'd like to ask Lara to introduce herself because I know many of you met her last night at the event, but you didn't meet her today, so. Hello everyone, my name is Lara Geringer. I am the Community Engagement Manager for Shaping EDU. Um, I'm the voice behind a lot of those emails in your inbox. Um, and, and over the past couple weeks, I've had the opportunity to get to know um, virtually some of these fantastic students, and I'm so excited for you to get to hear from everyone. So um, let's go ahead with introductions. Tell us who you are, where you're from, um, and a little bit about what you think the purpose of higher education should be. Natalie, take it away. Hello. Um, hello, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, which, um, I would say don't worry about the cameras. Okay, yeah. okay, I'm not gonna worry about the cameras. I'm all, I had a video production background in high school, so I'm very conscious about that. But um, my name is Natalie. I'm actually uh, a recent student, so I just graduated in December, but I'm coming back on the student panel because I loved shaping you so much, and I haven't started a job, so I'm still a student. Um, I majored in computer science and minored in entrepreneurialism at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and I actually am a transfer student, so I went to community college, and I got associates in mathematics, computer science, and physics. But what I'm really here for is I'm an advocate for open education. I've always been really involved in open education. And in 2018, I was lucky enough to be awarded the first student award in the world. And um, the award was great. I'm so honored to have it, but I'm more excited to be working with people like you. The community is what makes me so excited about this stuff. And um, what does higher education mean to me? Um, it should mean to me the opportunity for students to go out and learn what they want to. It should mean to me the opportunity for students to create the opportunities they want and to mold an education where they can get the job they want. And to, at the moment, I really don't feel like there's that much ability for students to mold what they want. It's just kind of choose a major and go down that path that's made for you. But yeah, I'm hoping to see if we can change that and give you some input on what I've seen. Hi guys, my name is Alexandria Collier. I'm from Houston, Texas. So right now I go to a two year college it's called Houston Community College. I plan on transferring into the University of Texas at Austin, the, um, the Tyler. So we have a satellite school right there in the actual like whole campus. So we have like a college and a university, which is really nice. Um, it helps you just kind of fast track you into a school already, but they also have you know a lot of universities around in our neighborhood and everything. So I am an engineering student, civil engineering, with a specialization in environmental sciences. So the environment means a lot to me because if we don't even have it, what are we going to do? How can we even think about education if we don't have oxygen to breathe, you know? Higher education to me, or what it's supposed to be to me, is something that helps you get where you want to be. So like Natalie said, she was in community college, I'm in community college. Um, I still haven't graduated yet, but that's okay. I'll get there. And right now, like a lot of the higher ups don't really help you and they don't really try and even give you a plan. They tell you, you should do everything on your own, which is good because you should be mature. You should have your own agency over it, but a little help would be nice, you know, a little nudge in the right direction. Hi everybody, um, I'm Megan and I am a student here at ASU online. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, um, where I work for Adidas and I am at ASU as part of our partnership with, um, with the school. So that's super cool. Um, and I, to me, higher education is something that allows me to pursue what I want to pursue. Um, I went to university the first time right out of high school, like you do. And um, I pursued a major that I thought was interesting, but has no practical applications. Um, medieval literature, what? Um, it was fun, but you know, I think that now um, I'm pursuing a degree in interdisciplinary studies with concentrations in business and data analytics. Um, I'm using that in my job every single day and it is really allowing me to pursue a career that has a future and has use, and that's really exciting. 
<laughs> well, maybe I just didn't do it, right? <laughs> Hi guys, my name's Anita, and I currently live in San Antonio, Texas, and I am here with Starbucks College Achievement Plan that I would not have gone back to college without that option as a parent and a full-time job and just balancing everything that comes with life. Um, I could never have gone back in any other way, so I really appreciate this opportunity, especially being here today. Um, for me, education or higher education means possibilities. Um, neither of my parents went to college, and all of my siblings did, and I was the one who was like, I, I can get along without it. I can just keep working and have an okay life. But once I went back to school five years ago now, um, and I'm doing it really slow and long, and I'm almost there, but to me it means that when I finish school, I can hopefully help others who have that same work balance life problem <laughs> that comes you know, um, with a lot of having kids and trying to just stay afloat in the world um, and really show them that it is possible. It might take a lot longer than you think, but um, there are resources thanks to online education. Well, my name is Victor Ekwere. I'm from um, Nigeria. I school at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I also work at the university with IT as well, so I really love the opportunity to be here with doers and thinkers and movers in the industry, and I'm just loving the opportunity. What does higher education, what do I think the purpose of higher education should be? Really, when I think about that, what I think about is there's so, many, there's so many resources, so many schools offering pretty much the same programs. Um, the wheel is not being reinvented in any way, it should not be. So what should the purpose of higher education be to me should be beyond the skills that people learn on campus to character formation and character development through the education they get on campus. And um, for me, that's why when I, when I was looking for university back home in Nigeria, I chose to go to Oral Roberts University, where it's um, whole person education, talking about um, the spirit, the body, and the, and the soul, right? So where you can learn all of those things together. So for me, because when students leave, no matter how trained they are, when they go to their jobs, they are gonna to have to be retrained to be able to feel that particular role that they're doing. So beyond the training, I believe that education should actually make people better for society through character formation. So that's what I see for what higher education should and the purpose should be. Hi, my name is uh, Trevor Ellis and I'm a graduate student at ORU, um, but I've come from uh, Canada and uh, I uh, should say too that my background is in teaching. So I've spent a lot of time with uh, grades one, two, and three in the classrooms, uh, doing up shoelaces and putting on snow pants. And, uh, and so for me, when I think about the purpose of higher education is to really allow the individual to develop their individual potential for the collective good. So all of us wanna contribute. All of us wanna be somebody and contribute to a greater cause and greater good. So how, but how do we help each individual to come to the fruition of their talents and their skills and their abilities to be able to contribute to the collective good so that each person can say, yes, I can, I can run this nation. I can vote and make a, you know, a participate in this democracy. And I think that's in essence, some of the basic cores of the purpose of higher ed. Awesome, thank you. So Lara, I'm about to go rogue. Uh, just so I wanted to warn her before. So when I was listening to all of you, what I heard loud and clear was this idea of higher education should be there to help you achieve your personal goals, but also help achieve the goals of society, the workforce, anything that's coming forward. And I also heard that, you know, that you want agency, but maybe not all the agency in the world. And what is that balance? So we have a question here is, so how much agency do you feel like you have in your learning journey? right now and what kind what is the role of that like how important is that and and are there any downsides to having a lot of agency or are they all up so uh the two people who i have on this are anita and then natalie so we'll start with anita and go to natalie
Oh, the, the Starbucks program? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You've opened the can of worms, now you have to deal with it. No, um, I feel super, super fortunate. So um, ASU has a partnership with Adidas in that um, we do tuition reimbursement and um, like a scholarship benefit. And it's been two, two and a half years that we've offered it. Um, I feel so fortunate to be able to be a part of it, um, not only do we have this partnership for the undergrad which i'll be finishing in august um but also for the graduate program so i'm hopefully going to be rolling into that and just really really fortunate um to be part of a company that takes the education of their workforce so seriously and really it makes me feel like they want each of their employees to be their best selves um and i feel really fortunate Okay, in Starbucks, um, we have a similar um, partnership with ASU. I have been started working for Starbucks in 2011, and I had just stopped going to community college because I just could not handle it anymore with everything else that was going on. And in 2014, I think, Starbucks and ASU began their partnership, and I started in May of 2015. Um, it's also a tuition reimbursement. We don't have a master's program yet, but that's okay, maybe. <laughs> if enough voices are out there. Um, yeah, it's, being a student has become like my identity because it's been a total of 10 years since I first started and like as excited as I am for it to be done almost, I'm almost like, then what? Like, I can't just go back to just working and, you know, um, so we'll see what happens. But the tuition reimbursement program, it, it can be a little confusing and for when you're first starting. And so I kind of through trial and error have learned about it and so one of the things I love to do is help the people I work with at my store at Starbucks and other areas because I live in San Antonio there's a lot of Starbucks there um, kind of like walking them down the path of how to do it and I get texts and calls from my uh, co-workers who are students at ASU also all the time because they're not always sure how to go about stuff like dropping a class and then how do you re you know how do you switch and things like that that are not really um, mapped out as well as they could be I think well, Anita, also tell us, um, how much agency do you feel you have in your learning journey? I would say now quite a bit because it's been such, it's been a lot of trial and error. Um, originally, the first few years, I think I struggled a lot with, like, every class is just so different. The professors look at it a different way and give you, okay, for example, some, some, um, Professors do like Monday through Friday, like everything's due in that time. And my days off happen to be the weekend. So like that made it really hard for me because those are the days that I would want to be contributing to my assignments, my discussion board, those daily ones. Um, and it also depends like for my job, what kind of uh, management you have. I have a, happen to have a store manager who's extremely supportive. And if I tell her like I have a huge assignment coming up and I move things around, she's very helpful. Um, but I don't think everybody has that and so it would be nice to know that there's other options for students to who work full-time and go to school online to communicate their needs and feel like they're heard and that their education matters just as much as them showing up for work on time and giving their 100 percent there and um to continue on with that i mean um how much agency i've experienced in my education uh like i said before i felt like there's degrees out there, there's options, but then you're just kind of sent down one path. There's not a lot of flexibility for working students, for students who have families, for students who transfer into university that did community college. You know, not everybody can just move away you know, on a dime and afford to move away. It was very expensive too. I mean, two years at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is a state college, still cost me around $60,000 without including food. I was not on a meal plan. And so when you add that in, I mean, that's easily $70,000 for two years. And I was very fortunate. I'm an only child. I'm admitting I'm fortunate. And I like had the resources to do that, but not everybody can just move away and do that. And also just the fact of limited classes, you know, different campuses have impacts in different areas. Um, there's sometimes like, oh, that class looks super cool, but there's only one class of it offered. There's only 30 students who can get in and it's only offered in fall. So do I really have control over my education? The answer to that question is not at the moment, you know, um, and that's not all of the educators fault, you know, just having employees. That's a huge factor. Having the resources, huge factor. 
But for the student, it, it again limits us. We're not able to create a class to supplement that. We're not able to choose our own assignments, you know, different classes by different teachers or not different ways. And that's sometimes frustrating when you get the bad teacher, quote, quote, nobody wants the bad teacher. Um, and we want to be heard on that and we want to do the best we can. I mean, the reason we look for these things, we look for these teachers and we look for these certain paths is because we want to succeed and we want to do the best we can. So um, I definitely think there could be more agency, but it is, I've seen a lot of change in the time I've been in education and I hope it continues to go towards more change and more openness and more open pedagogy in that way. Awesome, thank you. Um, you both brought up some things that, that actually tie us back to our first question, is that meeting the basic needs uh, is challenging for many students, right? So food, clothing, you know, Maslow's Pyramid. Um, so how can we make higher education a viable option for anyone who wants it? And I'm gonna hand this to Victor and then to Anita. <laughs> Well, I think one of the things that technology does um, is that it supplements and helps to make um, higher education accessible um, across the board. Um, one of the universities I love so much is um, University of the People, which is talking about um, pretty much any, anybody from around the world can begin to take online classes. So I think one of the, one of the ways that we can actually make education more accessible is through um, online platforms. Um, and also even more affordable, knowing that, again, my, my theory in code is that the knowledge is kind of repetitive already. So it doesn't really make sense to charge so, many, so much high prices when you're saying the same thing over and over again to, you know, to people. So I think that education can be more accessible through those online platforms and also um, looking at ways to make it cost effective probably providing more, you know, work study opportunities, um, even for those who are working online. Um, you know, that could be something we talk about when we begin to brainstorm as well. So just wanted to chip that in. So how can we make higher education a viable option for anyone who wants it, given that meeting your basic needs on a day-to-day -day basis is already hard? So when you're in an adult, an adult edu in education as an adult with children and full-time jobs, school is the thing, you know, classes and assignments are the thing that if anything's going to, if I'm going to have to give up something, that's what it's going to be. I'm not going to stop working and not be able to pay my bills. I'm not going to not take care of my kid. So making education, like, like the flexibility of online is amazing, but there's still a lot of hard and fast kind of deadlines or even like unrealistic in some ways. Um, just that I have, like I said, co-workers with multiple children and for them to, to sit in a room and have to um, do the proctored exams when they have three little children running around and no help is really hard. So I, I don't know the solution, but I know that it's going to be, it will be more accessible, more viable options for people with a lot of other responsibilities if there's a little more either leeway or understanding or like someone on the ground to support them, not just, you know, someone they can email or talk on the phone. Like, I think it's important to have like ambassadors, people who have already been there and done it to kind of, um, I don't say comfort, but like walk them through it and stuff like that. So. Building on that idea, Megan, I'm curious, what do educators and institutions need to understand to better meet the needs of adult and online lear learners? I think, very much what, what she was saying in that an adult online learner has different responsibilities and experiences than someone just out of high school. Um, I have three children. Um, I work full time um, on the PTA at two schools. Um, I am pursuing an athletic career. Like, I have a lot going on. And I think that I've had some professors who have that flexibility and it is a little more like, everything's due by the end of the term, have at it. And that's, that sort of flexibi flexibility is really great in that if I have time to sit there for an entire day and just hammer out like 12 assignments, I can do that. If I can't do anything for three days, it's not the end of the world. And I think having that 
increased flexibility and that understanding of like, I'm there because I want to be. I'm not there because somebody has told me, oh, when you graduate from high school, you go to college and you do this and this is how you do things. I have taken a lot of time out of my life to say, this is where I want to be. Don't give me busy work because I don't want to do busy work. I'm here to learn everything you can teach me and just doing something to get a grade or to show that I'm on a discussion board three times a day. I don't have time for that. <laughs> I see a lot of snaps over there. <laughs> totally agree. I, I went to college as an adult as well, so totally understand. Um, so I want to go to some things that you're talking about is some of the challenges that we have in that um, meeting the needs of online and adult learners. So how do we change the relationship and expand this over your lifespan, right, to the lifelong learner and having you continue on as you move into the future and you're at a job and you need to upskill. Um, so how do we change the relationship between higher education and students and really learners to meet the immediate and the future needs for continuous lifelong learning? And uh, so I, I'm going to toss this over to Alex and then ask Natalie to, to contribute. So what I'm thinking is kind of building upon what they said, we do need people actually listening to what we're we're saying they always want to throw uh, surveys at you. How did we do? Did you like this? Was this great? Out of five, why would you rate us? Oh, why would you rate us? And then that's it. But they don't want to do really work behind that. They just want surveys, feedback. They're like, oh, okay, cool. A hundred thousand people said yes or no to this and that. That's it. That's the end of it. We'll just put this in like an archive, say that we did this, but not actually put work into it. That's not okay. And I know that maybe some schools are suffering and they won't have enough funding to have hired more people to try and support the actual staff and students because it can't just be all on the actual staff, the professors and stuff. And it can't just be on the counselors and advisors because sometimes they're overworked or they think that they're not being paid enough. So that's why they don't try and help you. Like I was saying earlier with student agency, they kind of just threw me like they're like, whatever, just figure it out. I don't have time for this. I'm sorry. And it's fine. It's a trial and error process. You have to figure it out on your own. And it kind of sucks in that aspect. So having something, not just like a little chat pop up, like, oh, is everything okay? Are you doing okay? I can talk to you. I'm a robot. Like, I'll try and listen to your problems. And with my AI, I'll try and figure something out for you. Like, that's some something it's like a stepping stone but we do need like actual humans or at least an ai with an actual brain that can yeah. that can that can figure out the tone and and everything and how you're saying it like oh this person's really distressed in school what can we do how can we reach out and get people before they have like a break before that they think maybe this isn't for me and they just drop out and they stop because there have been a lot of people a lot of times where they're thinking is this really worth it i could just get a job and just stop going to school whatever a lot of times people want someone to listen to look that oh maybe they're struggling maybe they need help and it can't just be all on that person um i think maybe some stepping stones would be not hiring like a lot of people maybe trying to start with one person build a small network, maybe have clubs and communities, maybe online and in person. So maybe not everyone can meet in person. Great. We can have teams on like uh, windows and stuff and like all that Microsoft and try and have a connection of people maybe based on their majors or specific needs and interests. Not too sure how maybe we can do this on a collaboration later. Um, but really having people that care and actually genuinely care for them and care about the students and humanity because a lot of people working in education kind of just did it and they're in there and they're, they're like, whatever, their apathy shows. And to build off that, I mean, I think the biggest problem in education has been just connecting to each other. And I know a lot of students have had some jaded views of our, at, like, of our schools, you know, whether it be like, why are they taking so much money from me? Like, where is it going? What does this mean? 
um, okay, so I'm paying a health fee, but I never once visited the health center my whole time in college. Um, I paid the health fee and I can only get two counseling sessions when I really have so stressed out, I don't even know how to handle my life right now. And um, I mean, I've heard of different proposals for it. And I think having communities is an awesome thing. And I almost think that there should be a requirement maybe for community, but at the same time, that's another requirement for us to meet. So it's hard to figure out the right answer as far as that goes. But I think sometimes I, I, I would love to see educate, like education systems, like the school itself, be more open. I think that that's one big flaw. We don't know where our money's going a lot of the time. We don't know what's happening and why, like we're getting a certain grade sometimes. And it's just, or who we're working with and who's on the other end, you know? Um, when we call the administration office, it's like, who am I talking to? What importance do they have? Or why do I need to like figure out how I can balance the fees? Or why is my FAFSA not going through? Um, all these different questions. So I think to promote lifelong learning, I think at schools and education systems, we need to be more open and need to realize that all this information we're giving them is worth something to us and they're not valuing that. And that's sometimes frustrating, but then, um, Maybe education systems can also help us pair us into groups. I mean, whether you have a family, you know, that'd be nice to know other students in your class that may have a family. And if you decided to opt in to like pair into different groups of like, whether you have a family or another female engineer or you're in different groups that might be minorities or not, you know, just relating to different people in classes would be really helpful. Uh, I know in online classes, like I don't know anything about the other students in there. You just know their name and sometimes a funny picture, <laughs> whether it be their dog or actually them. But you know, um, yeah, so I think it's just about getting to know each other and then education, like the education institutions being more open about what they're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, as teachers, we like, you know, when I'm teaching my students who are younger, the scaffolding, scaffolding them like, with their mental, like what are you learning, your knowledge, your emotions, uh, your how you're doing socially, right? And so as a grade one teacher, I have these 20 students that I'm watching over every day. And it almost seems to me like the way things are going, it seems that that, that scaffolding that's being provided is almost being pushed higher and higher into high school, into higher ed, where the teacher or the, the, uh, the advisor is almost looked to, to like even with mental illness and things like that. So how do you, how do you scaffold emotionally, socially, you know, mentally, spiritually, where it used to be just higher ed was like, I'm just gonna scaffold you and teach you mentally. But now that scaffolding is like, I'm gonna actually have to like, you know, be required in some capacity to scaffold you and to help you in a much wider range. And how, do, how does higher ed service that? And how does higher ed do that when those needs that used to be at a higher ed, just, you, know, in, in, you know, in high school or middle school are now being pushed higher? And how do we respond? One thing I'm hearing from all of you is this need for alignment between what you're learning in the classroom and what you have going on in your life and your career. Um, how can we capture meaningful learning? What does it even mean for learning to be meaningful? Um, and how can we capture the breadth of experience in higher education? Megan, do you have some thoughts? <laughs> I had a feeling that Sorry. Um, Yes, I think that um, standardized tests don't work. Sorry, everybody, it doesn't. Um, projects work. Um, things where you can create an output works. Um, I just finished a course in data visualization and I loved it. Um, but all of our work was producing visualization and taking data sets and doing, and I loved it partially because I was learning so much and able to do it, but that's what I do for a job every day. And so I could say, okay, this is, I understand this and I'm getting more and it's building for my job and for my education. And it's making me feel like I came to the end of the term having learned something meaningful. Um, Courses where it's all just like, yes, no, multiple choice. I don't feel that I am learning and internalizing those sorts of things um, as much as if it's really immersive. If I'm watching a lecture that was recorded five, 10 years ago, you can tell, um, and then doing multiple choice, yes, no, true, false, I am not retaining any of that. Um, give me something to do. 
where I can create something and share it, I'm going to learn. Looks like we have an audience question to build on some of the things you're talking about. Oh, I do. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Hi. Um, so uh, that's a really good point that you have about not being tasked merely to collect and return information. Your prior comment was about busy work. And so I'm wondering how you distinguish those. So I teach philosophy, and that's about the process of thinking. And many of my students are very impatient because they're just, tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. And I'm like, what I want you to do is think for a prolonged period of time. I don't have time for that. I just want it, you know, the night before. So I'm wondering how you distinguish busy work from substantive process thinking or something. Yes. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> um, I think that that is the thing and that is where learning becomes differentiated. Um, you're going to have people who can really do that processing and have, I'm not going to say more, but different life experiences that have allowed them to think through things and to produce meaningful works, whether that be um, in, in that instance, a writing, for example, or um, if it's an in-class discussion or if it's um, measurable in some other way. And I think that uh, philosophy is really definitely one of those things where you can't sit down and do like yes no true false you have to it's substantive and um qualitative <laughs> as opposed to quantitative um yeah i um i think that so much of that is still that idea of taking something and working through it to produce something meaningful and just to build off that, I'm a big open pedagogy person. And open pedagogy is the idea of having students create things and students to get their hands on stuff. And I think that a lot of the busy work you just assign, you know, to the student, like you define the parameters, you give them pretty much a rubric to go by, which is great. And a lot of like more written assignments and projects are like more open. So then it's not like they're just confined to one thing. But like, let's say, do you have to write an essay on this very specific topic, then it's very confining. And it feels like busy work because you a student might, may not be passionate about it, you know. But if you had an essay that was more open, you know, and the idea of like, okay, student, go find a time area that you're really passionate about, and maybe a health disease in that time area, and then write a project on it. But there's still open enough um, parameter that they can make it what they want. And so I really would push for if you want learning to last and if you want people to be passionate about it maybe have them define what their assignment is you know so then they're already thinking about it they might get excited about it like two or three weeks before that's even due and then hopefully that they'll actually do the assignment versus just saying oh there's the rubric what do you want from me how do i get an a on this in 24 hours you know and um i think that that's sometimes hard to figure out and i know it's very hard to grade those things that's a lot of the reasons why professors don't want to do things that are more customized, and I totally understand that. I mean, I wouldn't want to work more than eight hours a week if I didn't have to. But at the same time, um, I think it just benefits students so much more. The more you can give, you know, the more the opportunity and the more flexibility and the more passion a student can put into a class, you know, you can make, you can make psychology about anything, um, which is super cool. I mean, I'm a computer science major, and to think the psychology that goes into developing something, I'm like, I'd rather write about that than write about, like, um, an influential individual in psychology that I might only have to know for that one class, you know. So um, there's just a lot of ways to customize things and I really encourage everybody in here to challenge your students by having them to create their own rubrics and their own assignments and sometimes even their own tests. Looks like Tom has a question. We're going off road a little. <laughs> Yay. Hold, hold on to your uh, hats. It'll be a bumpy ride. Um, okay, so I have a bit of a follow on something you said earlier, Megan, uh, and also relating to this question in the sense that um, I'm always in this battle in my classes between giving students flexibility and having them shove everything and try to do everything three days before the end of the semester. Um, a lot of the stuff that I do in my class is designed to be formative in the sense, and this is, this is where you get into this battle around busy work. And the analogy I like to make with a lot of the assignments that I do in my class are it's like going to the gym. You know, and they're all built, geared toward that central goal. The outcome of my class is you're building a website and, and it's something that's yours that you can keep and it's a visible outcome. But you have to do the groundwork and work your way up that Bloom's taxonomy to get to where you can actually create a website that anybody's gonna look at. 
right? So that's sort of, and it, it's a government class. And the idea is that every, every student has a design challenge uh, or every group of students have a design challenge and they work toward figuring out all the barriers to solving this problem. And then they build a strategy document as a website to advocate for these are next steps. Um, so my question is, has more to do with your peers. You guys are not typical in some ways, okay? Um, you are all very thoughtful and thinking about what you're saying. Um, I have students who, a vast majority of my classes don't read instructions, blow off entire parts of the course, and then wonder why they're failing. How do you balance that? I mean, I would not be worried about you in my class, Megan, because I know you would take the steps necessary to work your way up, right? But, you know, I can't give you different dispensation than everybody else in the class as far as taking those steps up the ladder. So my question is, how do you deal with peers who are a lot less motivated than you are? I don't know if this is going to be a popular answer, but that's on them. That's on them. If they fail the class, that's on them. Mm. And I think that, you know, if I don't know how being a teacher in higher education works, I'm going to be super honest about that. And, you know, I would like to think that if you can show that you gave the steps and you gave the tools and just so like to go back to this class I just finished, it was very much like building to the final, like, this is what you've created. And there were steps along the way. And if you didn't do your assignments, okay. But it builds and it builds. And if you don't want to do that, maybe you're in the wrong class. And, you know, I think that that has to do, maybe that's, you know, that sort of idea of wraparound care of like you've got um, student success specialists and you've got advisors and you've got people who can reach out and say like, hey, noticed you haven't turned in your last three assignments. Are you okay? Um, because I think that there are going to be people who maybe it's their first time in school, maybe it's their first time um, doing some of these things and they didn't understand what they were getting into. Um, and I think having that sort of care where somebody is able to reach out to them and make sure they're okay because there, there are going to be students who don't care. And that's really unfortunate that they're spending that much of somebody's money to not show up. Like, that sucks. But I think that if enough supports are given and people still choose not to show up, that's on them. Well, and I feel like too, sometimes I've been in classes where they pair up students, you know, where you, sometimes you take a student who's doing very well and pair them with a student who's not doing too well. Because sometimes I've had classes where the directions the teacher gives me just does not make sense. Like for some reason, my learning way is not the way that they, like how they speak to me in their writing does not equate to what they want, you know? And so having somebody break that down for me and sometimes like I'm a bullet person, I would much rather have like, this is what it needs bulleted, you know? And some people like to write paragraphs of three pages and I'm like, I just can't absorb that much right now. And um, so sometimes I think pairing them, like if you can do group pairs or like encourage them to talk to you or maybe open. I know that people go through different situations, whether it be death of a family member, I have a family that I have to care to, so I need the whole week, um, I, which is hard to do. Like I said, this is all your time, you know, and it's hard to cater to that. But I think, I think having a pairing or just like listening to them personally and seeing maybe even having a conference halfway through the um, session if there are problems and say, hey, if you have a below a C, you have to talk to me one on one and we got to figure out like if you want to pass this class, how we're going to do it. Kind of adding to that, um, there, it's research. People learn differently, not what works for her is going to work for me. What works for you might work a little bit for me, but it might not get ingrained in my head. It might not last. So people learn differently. It would be nice if there would be some type of maybe test or stuff that we could maybe not like four students into doing, but something that they would want to because it would also benefit them. Like, how do you learn? How does it actually get into your mind and stay there without just being in short term and then being lost? Because if it goes into your long term memory, that means that it's going to stay and whatever you're learning is going to start building and whatever degree you're trying to go towards, it will be 
hopefully significant to you and in like those classes maybe they could have some type of channel or network and saying okay these people are visual these are verbal these are written oh there's a handful of group that they can only learn that way with everything i'm one of those people i need everything hammered into my brain constantly i want to see it i want to write it and i want to read it and not everyone is like that and that's okay but there are special cases so it would be nice if there could be something like that trying to ask people what they learn or how uh, maybe a test or some type of thing that wouldn't be too off-putting to people because some people would be like this is boring i don't want to do this why would i want to do something that will eventually be good for me but that could help maybe arrange how classes would be taught how they could change it because some some people will be like oh i've been a tenured professor why would i ever change my methods for one person or like two people like if you don't get it, well, I don't care. Like you can get out of my class, you can fail for all I care. I'm not gonna get fired for you. And that sucks because everyone matters or everyone should be, that's the point, right? No one should be like left to slip through the cracks. Yeah, just wanted to piggyback on, on that also and just amazing questions, by the way. Um, what I also think um, is that probably one of the issues that students are finding is the in, the, in our generation is like, they feel like they are put in a box. And, but I also think that whether, you, anytime you decide to pursue an education, there'll be some confines in which some expectations, then if not, then we could all just self-educate ourselves and then not go to school at all and do what we want. But education then, higher education then needs to find ways to enlarge that box, enlarge the playing space so that people can feel creative, but still there are certain outcomes that expectations that must be met for you to graduate from the school. But in that, you're not limiting them to um, the small box, but you are enlarging the box, this creativity, but within this bigger confines, you can run around all this place, but don't run outside there. Or you want it bigger? will make this place even bigger. Then you can run all around and you still have to get to a certain goal. So I think um, that's what I'm thinking because I mean, we can go back and forth with the flexibility and that, but I think that it's just to enlarge the box and not just the plain space. People are gonna come in that don't like how the assignments feel. Well, how can we give a, a, a broader scope but still get them to the desired outcome. You need to know how to write a basic paper. You need to know how to read, you know, whether I, I, that's, that's what I'm just thinking to, you know, kind of have that balance on there. Yeah. We're really hitting on some themes here, which is uh, these ideas of agency and what does agency really mean? And what are the, what are the supports for agency? What are the, the, the boundaries of agency? How far do we extend it? How narrow? Talking about personalization across here and that everyone's not the same. And, and, and how do you find that out is through a culture of care, right? And so do we care about our students? Do we care about our learners? And, and how do we really engage with them in a way that supports their learning and supports them reaching their goals? So this is great. It hit on basically all of our themes across the, the way. Um, we're actually, if we don't, do we have any questions from the online space? because we are out of time for the panel. So we didn't even get through all of our questions. Everybody was so excited. I know our <laughs> box was too small, Tom. You're absolutely right. Um, so with that, I think that if there are no questions from the online space, then we will move into the next phase.